a long time ago, these little creatures in the ocean, these little kind of jellyfish type creatures started making shells, which started trapping huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the shell itself. Now, the shell falls down to the bottom of the ocean or whatever it is. Now, this has been happening for hundreds of millions of years, not counting the coral reefs and all of that. So all of this carbon dioxide is trapped and it's it's not in the cycle anymore. And I was thinking, you know, one thing you never see in these sci-fi movies is a tank full of shellfish that's absorbing all the carbon dioxide that they're breathing so that they could have clean air. New studies show that by the time people reach their middle ages, the body often produces less than half of the collagen it did in their youth. Collagen is the main building block in our skin, making up 70 to 80 percent of it. This is why we get sagging skin and wrinkles as we age. If you want to look younger, you must supplement collagen, which will improve your skin's elasticity, make it smoother, more plump, and more youthful looking. That's why Ageless Multi-Collagen provides five key types of collagen you need from four different sources, essential to optimally support an array of full body benefits. No odor, no taste, no clumping, unlike other collagen supplements. And this is why I recommend health with adapt2030.com Ageless Multi-Collagen, a quick way for youthful appearance. Use the link in the description box below for 51% off my favorite Ageless Multicollagen. And now on with the video. And I do welcome you this evening, this afternoon, or this morning, wherever you are in this beautiful blue marble, skipping through the galaxy. So I'm right along here with Ransom Godwin tonight, 420 TV Freedomist Films. The changes are apparent. But now, what are the solutions to these problems that we're seeing pop up like spring mushrooms everywhere? There, you know, we all have a list of probably 10 things you could name in, in just casual conversation. But what are the solutions for those as we move forward into far lower crop yields than are anticipated are going to be coming in at the end of the year? Probably something like 20 to 25 percent under what all the predictions are from all these crop forecasting agencies to stabilize markets. How will people react and what kind of measures will be there to control the people after they react? So how would you control access to food and make sure that still the producers of food were protected when unruly hungry masses go amok, that kind of control. And then, you know, you see all these distractions around, and I'm quite now convinced the distraction is from what is soon to be a serious global food price crisis, food inavailability, all culminating in people getting super angry. So Ransom, welcome. Thanks. Fortunately, there's people in their 40s and 30s and even uh, from what I've been reading, uh, Generation Z similar to Generation X and in, in the way that they're trying to absorb old school skills and philosophies. My son is one of those people. He's a Generation Z. And the only thing that I'm kind of passing down to him is the ability to skip the universities and the system to be able to take care of himself. So first off, I'm learning along with him. So if I'm going to be learning, you might as well teach your children at the same time and show them all this stuff about plants, how to grow, what to grow. And he's getting to see it right along with me, like when we plant and not that much food comes from that. And the realization that, you know, if you were dependent on growing food yourself, you could starve if you didn't have a good year. And, you know, what would you do for backups? And that's what uh, I think the majority of younger people with that are caught on to some of these older guys that were there speaking and um, is to take from it that, unfortunately, the system outnumbers the few. So you're going to you're out there by yourself, basically, and, and uh, you're going to have to form communities of like minded people. And you're just going to have to go to the old waves. And right now it's probably the last little window that I think people have to accumulate knowledge from boomers and anybody older than them even. And they hold the last little bit of traditional hand-me-down knowledge from teaching other than going to a technical school. You know, like uh, almost everything that I've learned, I've learned from someone else 
doing things, working on stuff, helping people. And then I moved into construction and learned a lot of the same stuff there. But that's not what they're offering anymore. That's not what uh, young people have a an opportunity to get. So if they don't have someone um, that's reality-based, fact-based, science-based, and their approach to life to be a, uh, you know, kind of a a mentor, I guess, towards them. We're, we're looking at a idiocracy for real, not the movie, but in real time, like uh, we're already seeing it. Uh, you have to admit that <laughs> we're already a dumbed down population and I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but it, it wouldn't have got this bad if that wasn't the case. So if you have knowledge, you need to pass it down with emphasis um, to anybody you can. If your children aren't listening, teach it to some other, somebody else that's willing to absorb it. You know what I mean? And uh, we all got to teach ourselves how to take care of ourselves because things are looking pretty gloomy from gas prices to food prices to shortages. It seems like the manufactured supply chain shutdown is coming our way, whether we want to admit it or not. And it's starting to show up from everything from household items. Like if you were waiting on that new washer and dryer, you saw the uh, Secretary of State joking about that, that we'd be fine. But really think about that. Once we stop having things that work in our home, it's not really easy to replace that stuff. And if you can't just go down to a retail store and, and buy a washer or dryer or something like that, you're back to the old ways, going to the laundromat or hand washing that stuff. Life is about to change for a lot of people. And I don't think the general public is ready for that. Thank God there's little groups and communities that are trading information kind of like we are. Every time we learn something, we can pass it on to the community and save everybody saves time this way. Yeah, and you think about how many people are not going to be ready. But, you know, they'll kind of fall into a few camps of, I can't deal with it, don't want to deal with it, so whatever, and I'm just going to live my life and go down at the Titanic, don't care. There's other few who get the information, but they just don't know what to do with it. They're kind of like a deer in the headlights. They're stuck. They don't know how to start. Should I start? What are some solutions and that sort of thing? And it falls into that camp. You know, they feel it, but they don't know how to take action. Then the other ones who full on over freak out panic, which is too much. But then the ones who get into the zone, you know, getting some land, starting to grow food, prepare food, prep out, this sort of thing. I mean, I didn't realize how far ahead, you know, people like yourself and mine are compared to the average person out there that's going to have to get in and start transitioning to this pioneering lifestyle takes a long time to grow a garden and all the blight this year from all the extra rain in Tennessee out in the West is drought. So, you know, both places were affected. It was terrible growing the tomatoes this year. It's almost like I have to put a fan out there in the garden next to your tomatoes in a wild space because nature didn't blow enough air to keep the mold off your plants. I don't really think that many people are going to get prepared. And when this goes down, they're not going to be. So this brings me back to that one statement I was saying. How would you control the citizens if they get unruly and angry? Because governments understand exactly that breakdown and what's going to happen of people. So how would you control the populace? You know, you can't do it right when the event happens that number one day. You're going to pre-plan assets around in advance. Maybe you could use an event to pre-plan those assets you know, 20 years in advance. But whatever's there, this mechanism to control the citizens with police force and militarized police force on top of that, then the lockdowns too, because I was just talking to a few people from Canada over the last two days, and they were saying it's impossible. You can't drive out of Canada. It's like an iron curtain going up on Canada again. And, you know, you could talk for in depth about what's required. They can fly into the states and the flyback, they need to be completely vaxxed, double checked, nose thing, everything, but they can't drive a car. You know, they're like, it's an iron wall going up. So when you start to see these controls of moving a population, which was one fingerprint of the grand solar minimum I referenced a lot, population migration is one of those things that happen with the collapsing and uh, uh, shifting economy and then government change. So, where do we go from here should be the question. Government's already put a, several layers deep to try to get ready for the control of the unruly and this madness when people can't afford food, can't get food. And how are you going to protect your stuff? You know, the guy I was with, he's like, I got too much stuff. I can't protect it. So I, he had more acreage than I do. He's like, I got too much out there. I got the barn out there. I got this out there. 
So when it comes to it, how would you actually protect your stuff? I mean, you're going to have to have people with you. And I, I come to the realization that then who do you get out? Because most people aren't even listening. We're going into this thing at 100 miles an hour, no air brakes, no seat belt, straight into a concrete side of a mountain with rocket engines attached to the back of that. True information about the climate is getting sidelined by all this $150 trillion of carbon credits coming into existence or they're creating an asset class out of nothing carbon trading market are you it's an existential threat well don't put it in the atmosphere even one gram one molecule i'll, I'll let's leave it at a molecule of co2 it's an existential threat you can't put it in the atmosphere it's changing runaway global warming but i can register my forest and say i won't cut it for 20 years and then I'll get a certain amount of money for each acre just because I left the trees up to absorb carbon. And those are carbon credits that then you will have to buy if you didn't have enough of those. But to usher in this new economy, cryptocurrency, this carbon trading market, basket of currencies, gold, as the fiat system collapses around it, they're going to have to have something ready to go. So it doesn't come to a complete halt because that's not good for anybody. But there's all these mechanisms and, and platforms ready for the new world to start already at your fingertips. If you're gonna lose the fiat currency and the banking system and bonds for quite some time, you're gonna to have to have something else to replace all that. So this carbon trading market and non-usage tax as well, I saw some stuff in the UK. If you go and you buy an electric vehicle, you're gonna get charged now a tax, road tax every year, cause you're not buying petrol, which is a road tax included in the amount of petrol. So now you're being penalized for buying an electric car because you're not raising the taxes. You can't get the tax money. It's almost like if too many people buy electric cars, it's going to be free. We're not going to have money from fuel taxes. So like they're just calling it a road tax. So anybody who's going to drive is going to have to pay a tax on the road. Anybody, car, any cars, wheels, touches the road, you pay a tax that year. How much extra money is that? That's another something comes out of nothing, just created. Everything's there to show you it's being transitioned from the control mechanisms to the new economic, let say, platforms that would replace traditional banking, but would be faster because it's decentralized. It flies down the wires. You don't need the staff. You don't need the, the buildings. You don't need any of that anymore. You can remove that entire thing out because if you, an insurance company has to pay for it to be rebuilt or restructured, that's going to bankrupt the insurance industry. But if you just let it go and, oh, we're never going to come back to the banks, the buildings, whatever. It's going cryptocurrency now. We don't need the, the buildings any longer. People aren't there that are going to be prepped out with you enough to probably hold off the hordes unless the government can hold the hordes back in the cities and not let them cross any kind of lines when it gets real rough and they're out there pillaging. You know, I was thinking about this weird idea that you brought up about the CO2. I sent you that article that titled, it's from phys.org, and the title of it is Climate, removing CO2 from the air is no longer an option. As you know, lots of sci-fi movies that you watch on television uh, have the premise or, or it's in the background of the plot that in the future, humans have ruined the planet by global warming or uh, severe climate change, whatever it is. So in those movies, a very common thing for you to see is spaceships using algae for oxygen, right? When I was sitting here and I was, we were watching this movie last night and I, and I saw this in the background, humans are using algae and tanks to not only eat, so they're eating this slime or whatever made from algae, but they're using it to produce oxygen in these massive uh, spaceships that they always have. Now, I was sitting kind of as the cameraman in the background, listening to Diamond talk to one of the founders of Greenpeace. I think his name is Moore. He was one of the speakers at the event. He was pointing out that because we're in one of the lowest points of carbon dioxide in Earth's history, that a long time ago, these little creatures in the ocean, these little kind of jellyfish type creatures started making shells, which started trapping huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the shell itself. Now, the shell falls down to the bottom of the ocean or whatever it is. Now, this has been happening for hundreds of millions of years not counting the coral reefs and all of that. So all of this carbon dioxide is trapped and it's it's not in the cycle anymore. And I was thinking, you know, one thing you never see in these sci-fi movies is a tank full of shellfish 
that's absorbing all the carbon dioxide that they're breathing so that they could have clean air. They do show the algae portion, you know, producing the oxygen, but they never put that in it. It made me wonder if they didn't even want people out there to start thinking about the idea of the shellfish trapping carbon dioxide, like any kind of clams, what, what have you that make shells. They wouldn't want to put that idea out there because maybe people might realize, which leads you back to this article, removing CO2 from the air is no longer an option. So this kind of tells you where they're going with this. And the end result is some kind of fee, some kind of metered fee for you to be able to breathe. Now, they've already done it with food, land, water, et cetera, et cetera. And like you were saying with the driving, um, wait till you have to get special insurance to drive your gasoline powered vehicle down the road because everybody's forced to drive these uh, electric vehicles. And then that's so funny that you said that they would have to pay an extra fee because they're not driving a gasoline powered vehicle. 